What I'd like to do actually is talk a little bit more about the ASEA flow cytometer itself. Um, as a disclosure, I have no financial relationship to ASEA. However, we were a beta test site for two different instruments. And I'd like to share my insights in, into the instruments that we've had, um, the, uh, the Novasite machine. Now, as I'm sure we're all aware, flow cytometers are getting smaller. Um, there are actually quite a few out there, um, both for laboratory use and also for, for point of care instruments. And um, while these are very capable machines, they've generally only been in the one to four color range. They've been fairly limited in terms of their abilities. Um, but what I think is a very exciting development in flow cytometry is that we're starting to get small scale instruments that are now capable of doing eight, 10, 12 colors and maybe even beyond that. And um, this, I think, is a really terrific development. These instruments are less expensive, they're easier to install and maintain, and the technology is really dramatic, dramatically enhancing our access, not just for simple analysis, but for complex analysis as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about the ASEA Nova site. This instrument's been available for a couple of years. This is one of the beta units, test units that we had in our laboratory. It's very small. It has a 96 um, plate well sampler that can also handle 12 by 75 uh, millimeter tubes as well. It uses a syringe pump to inject the sample rather than positive pressure, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And in my lab, we love to pull the covers off things. Um, so I, without telling them, I pulled all the covers off. I don't think I broke anything. But it's very well laid out. The lasers are over here, the detectors, the filters, dichroics, and PMTs are all over here. The sample port and syringe pump is located over here as you look at down onto the machine. And just to remind you of something that I'm sure almost everyone in this room knows, um, for flow cytometry, most of our flow cytometers involve um, hydrodynamic focusing to focus the sample stream within a sheath stream. This is really critical for doing high resolution analysis of cells by flow cytometry to keep our cells confined within the center of the flow cell. Without sheath flow, the cells would be all over the place. And this is really critical uh, for this. And most of the systems we use rely on positive pressure using air pumps to pressurize a sheath tank that focuses the cells in the stream and uh, keeps them in the very center of the flow cell. However, you don't need to use positive air pressure. As it turns out, there are other mechanisms to do this. Peristaltic pumps can be used to supply um, both sample and sheath flow, and we're starting to see more of that in flow cytometry. Syringe pumps as well are being used. And I've never been terribly fond of syringe pumps in flow cytometry because by the time you get to the end of the syringe, you're out of sample. However, one thing that's impressed me about the Novasite is that it can pump more than one syringe full of sample through. It gets to the end of the syringe, it pauses acquisition, it brings up more sample, and then starts it again. And it's all pretty seamless. It behaves like a continuous flow system. Um, so I didn't even know the instrument was a syringe instrument. I wasn't conscious of it as I was using the machine. Now it's got three lasers, a blue, a red, and a violet. Uh, these are coherent OVIS modules, very high quality lasers. And the lasers are spatially separated from one another. So you do get the advantages of spatial separation when you're analyzing your cells. However, it does not have the same number of PMTs as it is capable of analyzing. This is a 13 color flow cytometer but as you can see, it only has six fluorescent PMTs plus side scatter. What it does um, to limit the number of PMTs it, ne you, it needs is it shares the PMTs. So as the cells pass through the laser beams, initially the 488 nanometer laser will excite the cells. The PMTs will be activated for those colors, for FITC and PE and such. Then when the cell passes through the red, APC and APC Psi 7, and then the brilliant violet dies. So it looks a little something like this. Um, the lasers are spatially separated, and um, when the cell is in the path of the 488, the detectors are active for FITC, PE, and all the PE tandem dyes, as well as side scatter. Um, but then once the cell passes into the red laser, uh, electronic time delays are employed to then trigger and uh, collect data using the same PMTs and the same filters but different fluorochromes. So for red and then violet over here. 
So what this allows the instrument to do is 13 color analysis, but only using six PMTs. It's simpler and it's cheaper. Photomultiplier tubes are a big source of the expense in flow cytometry. Now the sensitivity uh, is excellent. Uh, here we've just analyzed regular Spherotech rainbow beads over here. Um, here we're using the Fitzy and PEMESF beads. These are extremely dim. They're more comparable to the type of fluorochrome levels we normally see on cells. And the instrument does a very good job of distinguishing these. If you've used these beads before, you'll know that the dimmest population that can often correspond to only a few thousand molecules of fluorochrome is often very difficult to distinguish from the background. And in our laboratory, that's the real gold standard to see if our instruments are sensitive or not. Um, and if you compare it to, for example, an LSR Fortessa over here, you can see um, in this case, we're using those MESF beads, and the gray peak is the dimmest labeled population. You can see that the sensitivity is nearly comparable to the LSR as it is with the Novocyte. So certainly well within the um, sensitivity levels that we would expect from our flow cytometers. Um, one other interesting aspect of this machine is that it uses fixed PMT voltages. The PMTs are locked at the factory. They use detectors with very, or uh, ADCs with very wide dynamic range over six log decades. And you save your data without adjusting the PMTs. The BD Accury does this already. And I think in five to 10 years from now, all flow cytometers are going to be like this. A major source of error in our analysis and our compensation is the fact that we're fooling with the PMTs and we often have the detectors too low or too high. These detectors are fixed. You then zoom in on the data area that you want to see. It will make for far more consistent compensation between experiments. And I think this is a great trend. This is something that I think is going to be everywhere. Um, what you can also do with this instrument is take advantage of the full range of fluorescent probes that are available out there. We um, currently have seven brilliant violet dyes available to us, six if you don't count BV 570, which isn't quite as common um, anymore. But these can all be used simultaneously, as we all know, for really taking our analysis into high dimensionality. Um, this is what six color brilliant violet dye uh, analysis looks like on our LSR Fortessa, where we have six PMTs each assigned to one of the dyes. And we're able to do um, very informative panels. This is a six color experiment just off the violet laser, which you could then layer into um, a higher dimensional panel with your red or your yellow or your, uh, your 488 laser um, with very reasonable compensation levels down here. Um, you can do the same on the Nova site. I've only done five dyes here, but the instrument does have detectors for six. And the detection and compensation levels are very comparable to our more traditional machines. Um, so again, having this many PMTs in a shared format allows us to take full advantage of the brilliant violet dyes and the other fluorochromes that we have available to us. So I just want to show you a little bit of data. Um, this is uh, Irving Weissman's sort of standard uh, model for hematopoiesis, where we have long-term and short-term AHCs, multipotent progenitors, and then the cells split into myeloid and lymphoid groups. We do a lot of work in my branch on hematopoiesis, particularly in the mouse system. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Herx side population technique. This is now a 20-year-old technique that uses Herx 33342 loaded into hematopoietic cells to identify the earliest hematopoietic progenitors. They pump the dye out. We excite these things with an ultraviolet laser, measure the fluorescence in the blue and a red detector, and are able to see this little tail, this little side population, as, uh, as uh, Peggy Goodell called it, that is highly enriched for stem cells. Now, this technique, as you know, requires an ultraviolet laser. Um, recently, a dye very similar to Herx 33342 called dye cycle violet has often been used instead. This dye is better excited at 405 nanometer than Herx dye is. And in some cases, it's come to replace Herx dye for doing the side population technique. Um, so this is a typical experiment that we'll do when we want to analyze hematopoietic stem cells in mouse bone marrow. Um, we'll label the cells with DCV, but we'll also label them with cell surface markers for stem cells. We'll use a lineage panel here labeled with APC. We'll label for CKIT and SCA1. So what we're doing is taking 
the um, lineage negative cells, we're gating on the SCA1 positive, CKIT positive cells, and you can see that the cells are highly enriched for side population uh, stem cells over here, over 50%. Um, we can do many more colors. We can do up to eight uh, cell surface markers simultaneously if we want to. And it's a good combination of cell surface markers and a physiological probe for looking at stem cells. Now, you can do this assay on the NOVA site as well, and that's one of the things we used it for beta during our beta test period. It does have a violet laser. It's got a red and a blue filter over here. And the data actually looks very nice. Um, again, the same labeling that we saw before and we get a very clear side population analysis. So an experiment that is a little more complex than your traditional cell surface phenotyping. You need to use a physiological marker. We're analyzing in linear scale on the dicycle violet here rather than log. And this small platform, this an ins a technique that used to require a much larger, more complex instrument can be done on the smaller platform. Now we also had the opportunity to beta test a BYR configuration of a NOVA site, blue, yellow, red. Um, they've substituted the violet laser for a, with a 561 over here. Otherwise, you can see, except for the uh, array of filters and dichroics over here, the optics are pretty much the same. Um, again, very high quality, nice coherent OBIS lasers. Fairly powerful as well. Um, and again, we are using spatially separated lasers here. So as I'm sure many of you are familiar with on your Fortessas and other instruments, in this particular configuration, we're taking only Fitzy, PerCP, and PerCP55 off the 488 laser. We're going to do all of our PE and PE tandem excitation off of the 561 and have access to things like red fluorescent proteins as well, and then the red uh, detector as well. So for people who need access to red fluorescent protein analysis, this is, whoops, actually a pretty good, uh, a, a nice um, custom configuration. And the addition of a laser that we normally find only on more complex systems. We're starting to see lasers like this being integrated into the smaller platforms, which I think is a great trend. Um, and again, the sensitivity, here we're looking at the BANGS PE MESF microspheres. Uh, we're going to get better detection of these microspheres using the yellow laser than we will with the 488, of course. And we're getting, again, almost comparable sensitivity between the two platforms. This is another uh, a Spherotec PEMESF microsphere cocktail over here, and same thing. So the two are essentially interchangeable in terms of sensitivity. Here we're looking at PE uh, Psi 5 MESF microspheres, so we're looking at a PE tandem. And again, again, same situation, nearly as sensitive as the, uh, as the, the more expensive, more complex instrument over here. Um, it's also great for fluorescent protein analysis. <clears throat> um, remember that our 488 and our 561 nanometer lasers are spatially separated from one another. So we're not going to get the spectral overlaps between, for example, in this case, GFP and DSRED than we would if we were analyzing both of them off 488. By having them on separate lasers, that yellow laser is not going to be exciting GFP, and you're going to rate greatly reduce the compensation that's required between the two of them. And again, this is uncompensated data here, but we're able to analyze uh, DS-RED and GFP uh, analysis, um, uh, signal very, very nicely uh, using this particular system. We can also take advantage of some of the longer uh, fluorescent proteins, like HC-RED, as well. Um, these are the clone tech. Uh, M. cherry microspheres. This is six populations, one, two, three, four, five, and an unlabeled. If you've used these, you know they're very dim. They're a real test of sensitivity for your cytometer for this particular fluorochrome. And as you can see, between both platforms, we get essentially comparable sensitivity between the two. So I'm not going to take uh, really much more time except to say I think this is one element of a very exciting development in flow cytometry, that instruments um, that used to be much larger, much more expensive, are being reduced in size, they're being reduced in cost. Cytometry is getting cheaper, and we can do the same experiments on less expensive, smaller instruments that we used to require larger platform machines to do. Um, and I'm starting to, we're also starting to see, first of all, optical complexity in these systems. The filters are not fixed. 
They can be removed and modified by the user. They're also starting to offer, offer specialized laser wavelengths like the 561 nanometer for more specialized applications. Um, one thing I think that's not always really appreciated about these smaller instruments is that they are a lot easier to transport in and set up, uh, particularly in areas that are a little more remote where hauling in a gigantic sorter is going to be problematic. These things can usually be brought in, set up easily, and maintained much more easily in more remote or inaccessible uh, 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 locations. Uh, they're also taking advantage of new technologies like the fixed PMT voltages. I think this is something we're going to see in all cytometers in the next five or ten years. We really shouldn't be playing around with our PMT voltages nearly as much as we do. We're not that good at it. Um, and ultimately, the best way to solve this is simply take that away from us and keep the voltages fixed. Um, I should say on this particular machine, uh, you can adjust the voltages if necessary. However, no fluorescent signal that we ever analyzed, including things like high-level GFP expression, ever exceeded the dynamic range of the instrument. So in our case, it was not necessary to adjust the PMT voltages. Um, what you're also starting to see is these instruments are starting to be approved for clinical use as well. The Novacite is uh, approved for clinical use in China. Um, the Cytoflex, which Beckman Coulter makes, is currently up for clinical approval in China as well. And I think you're going to start seeing some of these instruments move over to the clinical realm as well as the research realm. So I will end there. And um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. <laughs>